Good evening. My name is Micah Green. Um, I'm a professor at Texas A&M University, and we, I'm going to be talking about uh, Maxine Nanosheets. This is a collaboration between uh, my group, Miladin Radovich's group, and Jody Lukanas's group. Uh, this is a recent picture of my group back together again after the pandemic. And the student who did the, the, the lion's share of the work you're about to see is Zhao Fei Zhao, who uh, is about to graduate. All right, so if you've never heard of Maxine's, this is uh, a new 2D nanomaterial that has been the focus of a lot of work in the last decade. Uh, uh, looks like Yuri Gagatsi and Michelle Barsoom have been right at the forefront at Drexel in, in um, pioneering this particular area. The, the name Maxine refers to M, which is uh, here shown here in blue, X, which is either carbon or nitrogen, and then the T part here is a, a terminal group um, that's, that's applied during processing. The way you make these things, you start with a max phase, which is M-A-X, the A is usually aluminum, and you have to etch out that A phase. So you can see here in this diagram, um, the aluminum is etched out, removed, and you're left with this structure, which my, my students always call the accordion. You can see it's like, a, imagine a, a multi-decker sandwich where all the bread has been removed, so it leaves those gaps. And then you can intercalate this with other chemicals and sonicate to, to yield 2D nanosheets. So that's how Maxines are made. Um, they are not easy to make, I'll note especially since the, the etchants are usually um, hydrofluoric acid or some similar sort of acid that's, that's uh, a bit dangerous to work with. So that's uh, usually the biggest barrier to entry. The reason people care so much about Maxines is um, this combination of, of colloidal stability, hydrophilicity, high electrical conductivity, and then uh, you know, a lot of uh, associated properties um, in, in composites and devices and films, things like that. There have been just a wealth of publications in this area along these lines. Um, so there's a lot of papers out there and a lot of publications and presentations on Maxine's, but I'm going to talk about one of Maxine's problems. Um, the reason that they've been around for 10 years and you're not seeing them as much in consumer products is that they, they have a, a really key pro problem. Professor Barsoom always said uh, Maxine's are like fish. After three days, they, they start to stink a little bit. And so the Achilles heel of Maxine's is that after a few days, they can start to oxidize, especially if they're in some sort of water environment. You can tell this through different ways. I mean, sometimes it's visible. You can actually see uh, the color change. If you do microscopy, you can see uh, TiO2 in the case of, of Ti3C2. Um, and you'll start to lose electrical conductivity. You'll see things crashing out of solution. So this is one of those real problems that undermines uh, this particular nanosheet that doesn't show up for other devices, that for, for other nanosheet families. So this is a big problem. You can imagine the number of papers that are out there that say, look what you can do. Uh, but after a few days, th th they would lose those, those particular properties. Um, there's been some controversy in the literature about what causes this. Some early papers actually argued that dissolved oxygen um, in water was the cause. Uh, but then later papers said, you know, if you actually use, you know, bubble argon through water, you still get oxidation and you, you don't if you put it in isopropanol. So it seems like water is probably a big piece of that. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to mitigate ox uh, Maxine oxidation. Um, if you keep them in a dry environment, if you put them in a freezing environment, if, uh, if you encase them in a polymer composite, these are all different techniques that have, that have proven effective in slowing down oxidation. Um, but what I'll talk about today is something that, that our groups have, have worked really hard on, which is to uh, make Maxine's more stable through the use of antioxidants. So this is a, a pretty clear image here on the top left. You can see if, they, if you take the, just the as-prepared Maxine nanosheet dispersion in water and you leave it for three weeks, that it, it clearly oxidizes and you get TiO2 and amorphous carbon. Whereas if you use something like sodium ascorbate, um, it'll, it will stay and remain stable and stay in that same form for months. And so um, you can prove that through different techniques. You can measure a conductivity. Um, here we, you see the, the, uh, the XRD uh, uh, showing whether you get no oxidation or, or a lot of oxidation, depending on what you use. Ascorbic acid is another effective antioxidant. That's one that many of you will recognize because ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Um, you can also monitor exactly what's happening based on the hydrodynamic diameter that you can measure using dynamic light, light scattering. In sodium ascorbate, it's fairly stable, whereas just in, in the normal dispersion, it starts to go bad after a few days. Um, the zeta potential, this is a mark of, of, uh, of uh, the, the net charge that's coming from those terminal groups that allows it to remain stably dispersed in water. Um, you get something pretty nice and stable with the presence of the antioxidant, whereas if you just leave it in water, you see changes even in the first day or so. Um, so these are all different examples of, of the kind of, of uh, problems that you, can, that you can fight off if you use antioxidants 
with, uh, with these nanosheets. Now you can measure this through XPS. Here, the, the red is really the key part. That's the part that shows you that signature of, of um, TiO2. And you can see uh, in water, you get a lot of this stuff. And in sodium ascorbate, you don't get nearly as much. So this is really valuable. It means that um, Maxine's, all the promise and all the excitement surrounding them, it doesn't have to fizzle out because of this oxidation problem, because there are ways around it. Um, you can also see, see that in electrical conductivity. So there's a couple different comparisons here. One is you keep two dispersions and then make uh, conductive films out of them. And if, it, if you don't protect them, um, the, the conductivity will drop uh, below the detection limit after, after a few weeks. Um, similarly, you can even make, you can take the original fresh dispersion, make uh, uh, vacuum filter films out of those. And the one that was exposed to antioxidants will retain that functionality and hold off oxidation for a long time. You can see that in the uh, electrical conductivity results here. Once it's been exposed to antioxidants, it's, it tends to protect those nanosheet edges and prevent any further problems. Um, <clears throat> this, this work was featured pretty far and wide, partially because it was both experiment and then we actually backed this up with some molecular dynamics simulations using Reax FF. So here it was featured on the, uh, the, the web page of the American Ceramic Society. It was also featured on the front page of the National Science Foundation. Part of the reason was because um, there's a lot of interest in vaccines and everybody's heard of vitamin C. And so it's pretty great that, that a, uh, an antioxidant that even humans will use like vitamin C works to protect these novel nanomaterials too. Um, <clears throat> we've also recently looked at uh, how other colloidal factors can affect vaccines. Uh, for instance, if you put them in an alkaline, alkaline environment, you get much fact, faster oxidation than if you have an acidic environment. In, environment. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, uh, salt doesn't seem to play much of a role. Um, aggregation doesn't seem to play that much of a role, um, but you can really see the big differences uh, when you look at uh, acidic versus alkaline. Um, and then in the midst of all that, <clears throat> as we looked at a number of different acids and buffers, um, we realized that citric acid um, it does even better. It's one, of the, it's one of the best antioxidants we found and allows these vaccines to stay stable. Um, uh, very little of that TiO2 formation even after 50 days. So it really does a, a great job and allows you to keep these things on your shelf for a long time. There's been a lot of commercial interest in these materials, but you can imagine if you're a commercial supplier who wants to leave people with vaccines and sell it to them, they need to be able to, to, to stay on the shelf and not change for months and months. Um, just a few weeks is not gonna cut it. Um, <clears throat> this also works for other vaccine types. So most of the results I've shown you so far are for are for TI3C2. That's by far the most commonly studied vaccine. It's the easiest to make. Um, <clears throat> but this also shows up for other vaccines as well, like TI2C. Generally, these 211 vaccines are much less stable than the 312s, and these are protected as well by using these simple antioxidants. Um, right now, we're in the midst of a big study to show, you know, to look at a, a really wide variety of antioxidants to show um, what kind of things will work. Um, if you're interested in this topic or you have uh, questions that come out of this conference, uh, please feel free to email me. This is my email address, or you can even reach out to me via Twitter. Um, one last thing I'll leave with you. Um, for those of you who have not worked in the area of vaccines and you're thinking about it, um, this is an area that it's not easy to just dive straight into. There are a lot of safety concerns. Um, I, I'll leave you with this. Um, my group partnered with the Mary Kay O'Connor Process Safety Center at Texas A&M. We actually wrote a big review recently about the uh, processing hazards associated with uh, working with vaccines in the lab and associated with potential co commercial scale up. Most of those hazards are related to the use of acids in the actual etching process and removing things like HF. Um, and so if you're, if you're looking into this area, whether you're in academia or in industry, I would definitely recommend this to you. This is one of the most uh, uh, sought after papers in engineering and industrial, oh, sorry, uh, INEC research um, last year. With that, I'll stop. I think I've managed to stay under my 10 minute mark and uh, I appreciate all of your, your attention. I'm sorry we can't be together in Los Angeles uh, this week, but I hope this will do the trick. Appreciate it.